want you to know that yes you can start your own business and make it succeed on six cassettes Brian Tracy tells you how to harness your energy and enthusiasm so they can pull you to certain business success in this inspiring program Brian Tracy talks common sense on the basics of good business you'll learn the importance of loving what you do and learning all you can you'll find out how to weigh the strengths and weaknesses of your product and marketing ideas and you'll discover the importance of long-range planning to long-term success Brian Tracy knows what he's talking about he's served more than 200 firms worldwide as a consultant in marketing and sales and as the founder of the Institute for Executive Development he's done years of research on what motivates people to become achievers Brian Tracy is also the author of several other Nightingale Conant audio programs including the best-selling The Psychology of Achievement so sit back now as Brian Tracy tells you how to start and succeed in your own business the purpose of this course is not to make you an expert but to give you the tools of all experts all really successful people in business I'm going to hit these points reasonably rapidly I've uh, made a decision that what you want is the greatest amount of practical usable information in the shortest period of time you are quite capable in your own business and in your own activities to take this material away and select from it what you need at the moment you must have a very very strong desire to be successful in business in order to attempt a business enterprise it's like embarking on a journey across an uncharted ocean because no matter what you start off with as a compass or a destination, the tides and the winds are going to change your direction very, very quickly. You must have very, very strong desire. You must really, really want to be independent. You must really want autonomy. You must want the freedom. You must want the success because you're going to be buffeted by the storms of business life. And without a very, very intense desire, you're going to be washed overboard. The second thing that you have to have is you have to have very clear, burning, compelling goals to which you're committed. You have to be able to determine exactly what it is you want to accomplish in terms of income, in terms of business growth, where you want to be in one, three, five, ten years. And you have to make sure that everything you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis is consistent with your goals. One of the things we have found is that if you are not doing something that contributes to achieving your aim, then what you're doing probably detracts from achieving your aim. And one of the major reasons for failure in life is the inability to focus single-mindedly on one thing at a time. I'll talk about this over and over as we go through the course. As a matter of fact, everything in this course is aimed at giving you the targets, the pinpoint targets for you to focus on in each area of business development. What are the key things that you have to hone in on and concentrate on in order to be successful? The next thing is belief. You must absolutely believe yourself to be capable in this field. One of the things that we find is that in business, some people are unique and have remarkable talents and can do phenomenal things in a short period of time. But the great majority of business people, 80 or 90 percent, are of primarily average intelligence. They are not great geniuses. They don't have extraordinarily high IQs. But they do have a very strong belief in themselves and their ability to succeed. They don't believe themselves especially to be inferior to anybody else, and they don't believe that other people are especially more talented or more capable than they are. In my years of experience, I have sometimes heard about business organizations and heard about business people running these organizations and how phenomenally talented they must be. And then when I go to work to consult with these organizations, and I spend hours with these same people that you read about in the newspapers, I sit down and I find they're really quite ordinary people they just happen to be focused or specialized along a particular line and happen to be doing things a little bit different than other people are doing. And we can think of all kinds of examples of that. John D. Rockefeller said that the two most important requirements for business success are patience and foresight, but especially patience. And we'll talk about this a few times. If you do not have patience, you can't be successful in business because almost everything in business is timing. There is a too soon and there's a too late. And sometimes, as business people, we always want things too soon. We always want things to happen at least a year in advance of their scheduled time. And very often we push and we press to make things happen early, and it causes nothing but difficulties. And of course, the ability to delay gratification. We live in a society where everybody wants everything now. We live in a society where we've been raised on television, which means that there are 30, 60, and 90 minute solutions to all the great problems of life. And we have a tendency as adults having grown up with 20 or 30 years of television to always be looking for quick solutions. We see all our life that the most fundamental and complex problems of human existence 
are solved in those short TV segments. And the very most we're willing to bear is a miniseries. We have to realize that sometimes people problems, market problems, take a long time. I remember I was in a very, very tight fix in business. We had over-ordered. We had bought too much of a particular uh, product. We had overextended our lines of credit. And the person that I was working for, we were talking about whether or not we had, if you like, ruined the possibilities of the company. I never forget him saying, Brian, it's too early to tell. I said, well, we've been in business for six months. He said, six months is not enough in the marketplace. He said, we have to wait. Let's give it another few months. Now, interestingly enough, as a young person, as an aggressive, impetuous person, another few months seemed like a lifetime. But as it happened, another few months was the difference between failure and tremendous success for that business. It just took a little bit longer for the business to get into the marketplace. One of the things that we always make a mistake with is we think when we introduce a new product, because we know it's a great product, everybody's going to buy it. Everybody's going to recognize the same thing we recognize. However, people change their opinions and their ideas toward products very, very slowly. Sometimes you have to be in the marketplace for three months, six months, nine months, a year, two years, three years before the product finally takes off. Home computers is a perfect example. Like IBM decided there was no future in the home computer market, and so they decided to stay out of it completely. But suddenly the market exploded and everybody came to different conclusions. And finally, you'll find that one of the keys to success in business is what is called method. Working systematically, patiently, doing the right things right, dotting the I's and crossing the T's, and then doing them as quickly as possible are the basic elements. And if you keep doing the right things in the right way, over time you must be successful. Over time you put all the odds on your side. And believe me, every single thing we talk about in this course, I have either done wrong and it's cost me a lot of money, or I've worked with corporations who have done them wrong and many of those corporations have gone bankrupt as a result and lost everything. When I used to hear some of these things, I'd say, well, <laughs> I don't particularly like that. That's not convenient. That doesn't fit with my schedule. So I would ignore that point. I would say, well, I'll ignore that point, and the rule won't apply to me just this once. Now, when you end up selling your house and selling your car in order to pay your bills because the market didn't allow you to get away with it even once, then you learn the lesson. Next time you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. So finally, the final analysis, it's not what you do, but who you are that makes the difference in success. So those are the internal, the personal qualities. Intense desire, intense goals, intense belief in your ability to succeed, continuing drive, patience, and the ability to delay gratification. The opportunity area that we're in today, and this is one of the greatest areas of opportunity in the history of the world, is that we have entered into the age of the entrepreneur, as well as the age of the intrapreneur, if you like, which we'll talk about in a second. But there are more corporations being formed now in our country than at any other period in history, and the rate of company formation is accelerating dramatically. And this is only the registered corporations, the number of sole proprietorships and partnerships that are forming that don't even get registered in the corporate registries is absolutely astronomical. It's up something like 500% over the last 20 years. Today in North America, there are something like a million businesses alone being incorporated every year. 20 years ago, it was 200,000 businesses a year. Now, of all those businesses, 80% will fail in the first four to five years. This is a part of a dynamic economy. One of the purposes of this course is to make sure that your business doesn't fail and that if you're in business and your business is not as prosperous as you'd like it to be, that it become more prosperous rather than less prosperous. Of over 800,000 millionaires in North America, over 80% of them are self-made. Over 80% of those millionaires started off with nothing, penniless, with an idea, a product, or a service, and they built their business to the point where it is today. And we know by examining the careers and the lives of most self-made millionaires that there are certain things that they did, and they're all in this course. We find that there are three major reasons why so many businesses fail. Number one is lack of knowledge. People don't know how to run a business successfully. Number two is lack of support. They cannot get the support they need from their suppliers, from their creditors, from their bankers, from their friends, from their customers, and so on. And number three is lack of capital, lack of money. They cannot get enough money to tide them over the inevitable tough times. The purpose of this course, the key objective of this course, is to give you the knowledge necessary to be able to get the support and the capital that you require. We know that it is not a terribly difficult matter to borrow funds for a good business idea if you know how to put together a business plan. Every single commercial bank in our society is there for one specific reason, which is to make loans to business. 
They like to make loans to consumers. They like to make loans on homes. But basically, their reason is to make good business loans. And if you have the knowledge necessary to put together the right business plan and the right business program, you will be able to make the applications to raise uh, the various finances. And not only that, it is the knowledge of doing the right things and doing right things right that gets you the support necessary in order to generate the markets, to get the suppliers to back you, in order to get the capital, in order to produce the product or service and so on. So they all tie together, but the knowledge must come first. And more people fail from lack of knowledge than for any other reason. All right, what are the key requirements for business success? As we say, business is an art as well as a science. It's a matter of practical experience, judgment, foresight, and luck. To be successful in business, you must never forget the basics. I was thinking last night that a business is like a child. Every single child is unique and distinct. It has unique and distinct influences working on it. It develops a unique personality. And no matter how many children you have, you never have two children the same, and you'll never have two people the same in the world. Businesses are exactly the same. They all require a certain amount of nurturing, caring, support, consideration, growth. They all have phases that they go through from infancy through to adolescence and adulthood and so on. And interestingly enough, because business is so big and so important in Western society, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars have been spent studying businesses. There are enormous faculties and some of the most intelligent men and women in the world are working simply full-time, 40, 50 hours a week, studying what makes successful businesses work. And so it is possible, just like there are many thousands of psychologists, nurses, doctors, and so on, working on studying what makes healthy children healthy, happy, confident, there are ways to raise healthy children, there's ways to raise healthy business. So what are the basics of business success? Number one role of business in a free society is to organize and coordinate the factors of production to produce the goods and services that people want at prices they are willing and able to pay. The role of business, especially the role of the business leader, the entrepreneur, is to combine resources, to take men, materials, labor, capital, and so on, combine them into products and services and get them to the market in sizes, shapes, qualities, and quantities that people want to buy and are willing to buy. All businesses that are successful are doing that right. All businesses that are unsuccessful are doing it wrong. The second thing is that it is the wants, needs, and desires of the customers that determine all business activity. It is not what producers produce, but it is what customers want that determines business activity. In other words, if a company is producing what customers want and producing it in a cost-efficient and effective way, then it will grow and prosper. If a company is not growing and prospering, that's the first corollary, then it means it is not producing the goods and services that people want. In other words, it's always us. We are always personally, as business people, responsible for the success or lack of success of our enterprise. Either we're doing it right, and if we're doing it right, the marketplace will tell us. If we're doing it wrong, the marketplace will tell us. And it's always the people in the marketplace that know what's right and know what's best. As customers for the same services, we want the very most for the very least, and we are also ruthless, selfish, demanding, and disloyal. In other words, if anybody can offer it to us cheaper, better, faster, we'll buy it from them. We have people who will work for a company or work with a company, buy from a company for 20 years, and a new company will spring up on the block, and they all transfer their business across the street to that company. I remember uh, when I was doing some work in the financial industry, I found that if one financial institution raised its deposit rates by an eighth of a percent, it would be like tilting a big tub of water, that money and deposits would start to flow to it from all other financial institutions. That's why even an eighth of a percent makes a big difference. A person could deal with a bank or a trust company or a savings and loan for 20 years, the instant that another savings and loan offers an eighth of a percent more, they'll walk right across the street with their money for that eighth of a percent. And this is just the way we are as human beings. We all want to be better off in the future than we are in the present. Therefore, every action we take is to improve our condition. Very important. And since we are always acting to improve our condition, we always want to improve our condition the very most possible. If somebody is buying from us, it's because they have come to the conclusion that all things being equal, what we are offering is at that moment and at that time better than what anybody else is offering. If they are not buying from us, they have made the decision that what we are offering is not as good as what somebody else is offering. Very important. We'll talk about this in marketing. Well, we know that uh, customers always make rational decisions, which means that customers are always right. I always, always find it interesting when I talk to business people, and business people say, well, you know, these customers just don't understand what they're missing. They don't understand. Customers are stupid. They don't see that what we're offering them is the very best they could get or the very finest quality, the very cheapest. No, no. Customers are very smart. 
Customers are brilliant, in fact. Customers are geniuses. Customers can discern the right differences every single day of the week. And it is never the customer who is wrong. It's always the business person. This is one of the hallmarks of successful businesses. They say, if we're not selling enough, if we're not doing enough business, it's because of something that we're doing. It's certainly not the marketplace. We, all, we know in a dynamic market, there are always opportunities for those who can find new, better, faster, cheaper ways to serve customers with what they want. Many of the largest firms in the world today did not exist 10 years ago. There are many billion dollar organizations that were not even in a person's mind 10 years ago. And there are many billion dollar organizations of 10 and 20 years ago that don't exist anymore or that exist in greatly reduced form. We live, if you like, in a dynamic market. There are always companies and individuals coming up. There are always companies and individuals going down. It's always happening. We see it with changing economy, changing demands, changing trends, and so on. As long as there are customer needs unmet or better or cheaper ways to meet them, there are money-making opportunities for the creative minority, which means that as long as people don't have everything they want in life, there are always opportunities to start and build successful businesses. The only question is, do we uh, take the time to find out what it is that people want? There are always business opportunities for those who are willing to lower their prices, in other words, to offer new products or services, or to change your customers. We have had uh, done a lot of research on employment, and we find that one of the things that stops individuals who are unemployed from getting reemployed, one of the major things is they keep insisting that they want to do what they were doing before they got laid off or before their industry collapsed, and they want to keep on doing that, and they want somebody to hire them to do that here in this place where they are living because it's convenient for them. They don't realize that in order to get reemployed as an individual, if your industry is changing, if your skills are becoming obsolete for one reason or another, in order to become reemployed, you have to restructure what you're offering. You have to either offer it to new markets, you have to change your wage levels, you have to demand less. I've counseled with people who said, I was earning $30,000 a year and I got laid off and I cannot find another job. I said, how do you mean you cannot find another job? I said, I've been everywhere, I can't find another job. I said, there are people hiring in your industry. Oh yes, they're hiring, but they're only paying $20,000 a year. I said, do you know why? I said, what has happened is that the market value of the service you offer has dropped to $20,000 a year. It's no longer 30. You may have been paid 30 under unique circumstances, but where do you have a better opportunity to earn $30,000? Trudging the streets, looking for a job that's not there, or taking a job at $20,000 and increasing your value? With companies, we often find that we offer our products and services at the very most that we can get. <laughs> for those products and services, but sometimes the market will take a kaboom and the price will drop out of our products and services if we continue to demand the same prices or we continue to try to sell the same products at the same prices to the same markets, very often the market will say, I'm sorry, I'm not interested. Often we have to lower our prices. Often we have to change our customers. One thing I'd like to point out is that a business enterprise is like a bundle of resources. As a bundle of resources, it can be turned in any direction. It is a bundle of capabilities, talents. It can be turned to manufacturing and selling dolls. It can be turned in another direction to manufacturing and producing computers. It can go into real estate development. It can market food products. In something like 70 or 80% of all the businesses that were surveyed, we found that the people who achieved the greatest success in entrepreneurial activities did not achieve them in the areas where they first started. They achieved them in areas different from what they started in. The most important single skill in business is the ability to get the goods out of the woods and move them to the end consumer. A company can absorb mistakes in every single area of endeavor, but it cannot absorb mistakes in marketing because if marketing stops, the company stops too. Profits are always a result. Profits are not the objective. People who start into business with the goal of serving customers well by giving them the products or services they want are usually successful and the profits follow. Customers pay all wages, not corporations, and everyone has at least one customer. One of the things that we have to ask over and over again is who is our customer? Who is your customer? Who do I have to satisfy in order to be successful? And then as you'll see as we go on a little bit later, who is my biggest customer? Who do I have to satisfy the most in order to be the most successful? I used to work for the chairman of a large conglomerate, which I mentioned before. And very early in my career with the chairman, even though I was doing about five or six things simultaneously, I made the decision that I had only one customer in that organization, and that customer was the chairman. And as long as I satisfied that customer, I could be slow or slack or make mistakes in any area, but as long as the chairman was happy, everything would be fine. If I did brilliantly in every area, but I didn't satisfy the chairman, I was going to be in serious trouble. 
And I suggest that is a very, very good strategy. Your success will always be determined by what you do, the demand for your product or service, and the difficulty of replacing you. The most important thing is how valuable is your service to other people? How valuable is it? You can tell how valuable it is by how much people are willing to pay you for it. The same strategies adhere inside a corporation. Doing everything possible to increase the value of what you do for your company makes you a more valuable person. Xerox had an advertisement uh, that came out some years ago, and the advertisement showed uh, sort of a little cartoon. In the first cartoon, there was a little boy with a lemonade stand that said, Lemonade, five cents a glass, scrawled on a sign, and he was sitting there with a pitcher and some glasses. And it shows another little boy walking up and setting up his own lemonade stand next door to compete. And his little sign said, Lemonade, five cents a glass, and then it shows the two of them looking at each other. So here they have the identical product, with the identical stand, and then the last little caption showed the second person who'd entered the lemonade market with a rose in each glass. And it says, when people compete, products get better. So in other words, he had added a little bit of something special, and it was the little bit extra that made all the difference. Well, if you wish to earn more, you must concentrate on increasing the value of your services. You will always be rewarded in direct proportion for what you do and the value of what you do. Your whole job in life is simply this, is to increase your value. Do everything possible to increase your value. Listening to tapes like this is a very, very important investment in your future. Well, the market only pays superior rewards for superior goods and services. It pays average rewards for average goods and services and it pays inferior rewards for inferior goods and services. And it's very, very important, and we talk about this in the session on strategic marketing, it's very important to identify what is it that you do in an excellent fashion? What is it that you do that is so good, that's so special, that you're better than anybody else who's doing it? Because unless you can answer that question, you're not ready to go into business. Well, the next is that Business success comes from direct developing excellence in a particular market-related area. I give you a perfect example of developing excellence. IBM, one of my favorite examples, one of the most successful companies in the world. IBM has developed excellence in a particular area, and that is service. They've developed excellence in a key area, and the market pays them a premium year after year, makes them one of the most profitable and most successful companies on earth. And it's because they recognize very early in business that service was a, a key consideration to the marketplace. Everybody would rather have leisure than hard work. There is a great demand, a great desire within the human soul to take it easy, to put up your feet, to retire, to relax, to just take it easy. However, it is the successful people who pay the extra price, go the extra mile, do the extra little things, make the extra habits, get up a little extra early in the morning, go to the extra courses, read the extra books, and so on. Those are the keys to success in business. It's always doing a little bit extra, and, and you always know that if you are contributing greater value than you're taking out, then you know that you are always growing in success and you're always growing in income. If you're only contributing exactly as much as you're taking out, that means you're staying even. If you're contributing less than what you're taking out, it means that you're falling behind. So the master key to riches is self-discipline. What are the seven personal qualities that assure success in business? Number one, you must know yourself and know exactly what it is you want in life. Goal orientation is an essential requirement of all successful people. And as we'll talk about later, we know lack of goal orientation goes hand in hand with failure in every single walk of life. Somebody should be able to wake you up at three o'clock in the morning and ask you, what is your major definite purpose in life? What is your number one goal? What do you want to accomplish more than anything else in the next three to five years? And you should be able to wake up out of a sound sleep and tell that person instantly. You must know it crystal clear. We know that our goals always determine the direction that we go in life. I was reading something by Thoreau last night. It says that you should go confidently in the direction of your dreams. It says that try to live the life that you have imagined for yourself and you will be astonished at how far and how fast you actually go in life if you always try to live consistent with your dreams about yourself for the future. And Conrad Hilton said that you've got to have a dream if you want to make a dream come true. Most self-made millionaires compare themselves to billionaires. Most people starting their businesses compare themselves to millionaires. But once they get to be millionaire status, they start to compare themselves to billionaires, and they think, geez, look how poorly I'm doing in comparison to the billionaires. But in every case, 
It's the vision that is the activating force. The greater, the more compelling, the more burning that vision, that idea of where you want to go and what you want to do. We find that companies that achieve great things always have somebody in the company who has a mission, who wants to do something really important. I was um, talking to a gentleman at the university not long ago who spent 25 years, from the time he entered biochemistry in his late teens, he spent 25 years and his whole dream in life was to make a major contribution to DNA research, the basic molecule of all of human life. That's all he wanted to do. And for 25 years, he had that as a vision and as a mission. And in the 25th year, he made a major breakthrough, which has now put him in line for a Nobel Prize. And he'll probably go down in history as one of the great biochemists of this century. And this is what kept the person going for 25 years, was the mission. The ability to focus. Very important. The ability to focus, as we've said and we'll say over again, is the absolute critical requirement for success in business, to set targets and to aim at those targets. People say, geez, I don't know if I can be as successful as other people are because they have more advantages and more benefits and more intelligence and so on. Don't you believe it? A person who is focused of average intelligence can run circles around a person who is a genius who doesn't have the focus. That is why people come out of the universities with PhD degrees and with master's degrees and with sometimes 5, 10, 15 years of advanced education and they can barely make a living and other people quit school in grade 10 and grade 11 and they come out of school and five or ten years later they have their own successful businesses it's not the basic talents although talents are important and education is important it's the ability to focus the talents that you have like a an arrow if you like like a sniper to be able to hit specific targets and that's why you don't have to think of yourself in terms of limitations many of us hesitate about going ahead in business because we think that somehow we lack the talents and abilities. We look at other people who are successful in their businesses and we think those people must have unique capabilities. It's only when you get to know these people and meet these people that you begin to realize that they're no different from you or I. The only difference between a successful business person, or let's say a person who has launched a business and one who has not, is what? Is the person who's launched the business has done it. The person who has not has not. And I've seen this by studying, if you'd like, hundreds if not thousands of entrepreneurs. All right, the next personal quality that assures success is you must determine the price that you will have to pay in order to be successful and then resolve to pay that price. For every single thing you want in life, there's a price. And there's a price that has to be paid and nature always demands that the price be paid in advance. And the price in business success is invariably hard, hard work. In order to be successful in business, you have to work hard. In order to be very successful, you have to work harder. In order to be even more successful, you have to work harder still. There is no substitute for hard work in business. Many people say, well, geez, look at that person. They got a, the right to sell or distribute a product or service, and they made it in three, four, five years. You never realize that behind the scenes, that person was probably working 16, 18 hours a day, probably for five years before they got their break and five years after they got their break. All you see in the end result is the nice house and the nice car. The reason I mention this is sometimes people start a business, they think, well, sure, I'll have to work a couple of extra hours a day. Uh, and as somebody once told me, when you start your own business, you only have to work half the time. You only have to work half days from then on. And you can decide which 12 hours <laughs> it's going to be. <laughs> in a recent study, they found that in our society, you work eight hours a day for survival. And everything over that, you work for success. If you're only working eight hours a day, you won't do anything more than survive. Every additional hour, whether you're working for yourself or someone else, is for success. And so it's very important that you keep putting in those additional hours, whether it's extra reading, extra study, extra work. There are many universities and many uh, psychologists and professors who have studied millionaires. They make it just a business of studying millionaires, interviewing them, bringing them together, uh, looking at their lifestyles, looking at their habits to find out what they have in common. One thing they all have in common is that they are always thinking about business and they work extremely hard. Number three characteristic is self-responsibility. You have to accept 100% responsibility for your life and for everything that you are or ever will be. Our great old saying, if it's to be, it's up to me. Very important. The acceptance of personal responsibility for everything that happens to you is the hallmark of the truly mature, truly successful, peak-performing individual. And the opposite of accepting full responsibility is making excuses. And many people have said that making excuses is a disease that is fatal to success. No matter what difficulty or handicap you may have, 
there is somebody else who has had far greater difficulties or handicaps than you who has gone on to be very successful. And there are probably thousands of people who have had difficulties and handicaps far greater than any you will ever imagine in life, and they've gone on to be successful in life. So remember, there's no excuses. That's the key to maturity, is that there's no excuses. You must make a total commitment to your success. Burn your bridges. Total commitment is absolutely essential in order to be successful in anything. My friend Charlie Jones, the uh, great humorist, says that the two keys to success are simply this, set goals, he says, and then make a total commitment to achieving those goals, and then let nothing dissuade you. Burn your bridges behind you, and let nothing dissuade you from going for that goal. Don't try to straddle. I've seen many people who have started a business on the side, and then what they tried to do is they tried to stay with their main line of work, and they've tried to make their business successful too. And do you know what happens almost invariably? Their work deteriorates to the point where their employment is threatened, and they lose their money in their business. One of the things that I found over and over again, and I've been told this by hundreds of people, is that businesses require tremendous, tremendous total commitment and full-time commitment. Number five, you must be willing to work hard, to go the extra mile, and to always do more than you're paid for. One of the major secrets of success is always do more than you're paid for, and then you will always be paid more than what you're getting now. And number six, you must use your time well every minute, every hour, every day. Remember, this life is not a rehearsal for anything else in life. This is the real thing. And all successful business people, all self-made millionaires, look upon their time as a resource, and they're very careful with it. They spend their time the way they would spend money. And finally, number seven, back your plans with determination and persistence and resolve in advance that you'll never give up. Determination and persistence underline all success in business because you're going to be throwing every single ringer that's ever existed in the history of the world, and if you don't have enough determination and persistence, it'll knock you out of the saddle. If you do, nothing can stop you. Those are the seven key personal requirements for success in business. One of the things that we're finding over and over today, and there's an enormous body of research coming out, is that companies today need entrepreneurs. They need people who can specialize and create and innovate and find new, faster, better, cheaper ways to do it within the context of the corporation. 3M Company has something like 350,000 different products. And they have a tremendous ethic of entrepreneurship where they encourage people to experiment and to develop new products and processes within the company. And if they come up with something, they can often become the head of the division to manufacture that particular product. 3M will actually create a business around people who come up with new products and services. Every single company today needs men and women who are talented and who will stay within the company with their talents and skills. But the same requirements that are necessary for entrepreneurship, innovation, daring, risk-taking, and so on, are also required for entrepreneurship. Many of the people that we have studied who have become extremely successful and become extremely wealthy in business are people who never started a business on their own. Seven common characteristics of 83 self-made millionaires in a 20-year study of 1,500 men and women. They followed them for something like 20 years to find out how well these men or women would do in life. Good question. And they found at the end of the 20 years, 83 of the 1,500 men and women had become millionaires. And they went back and they studied the millionaires and they found these qualities and characteristics. They found out number one is that none of them ever set out simply to make money or to become rich. Many of the others who did not become millionaires set out and they had one goal in life and that was to make lots of money. And they did everything humanly possible in that 20 years to make lots of money and not one succeeded. The ones who didn't set out to become rich just set out to do something that they really enjoyed and they became totally absorbed in their work. And the word that they use throughout the study is absorption. And I pass this on to you because in every case where I have seen a successful man or woman in business, they have been totally absorbed in what they're doing. They've just been completely involved. They were not speculators or risk takers. There was not one investment scheme, not one speculation, not one gamble, not one stock market method. The only people who made money consistently and became wealthy consistently were the ones who were doing an excellent job, making a lot of money, and then holding on to the money when they made it. Sometimes they say success is a bigger destroyer than failure. We suddenly have successes and we start throwing the money around and we get into things that we don't know anything about and we get into those things and they start sucking up additional funds that we have and we can often go broke 
going down a side road. Most became millionaires almost unknowingly. One year, their accountant said, by the way, do you know how much you're worth this year? The person said, no. They said, you're worth a million one hundred thousand dollars. They couldn't believe it. And finally, they did not make their money investing. They made their money doing their work. And if they invested, they invested their money in their work, in their business, in their own companies. They didn't invest it outside. The conclusion that the researchers reached after 20 years of study was simply this, is that you'll always be most successful doing what you most enjoy. This is the greatest barometer, doing what you most enjoy. Whenever you think of a business, or if, even if you're in a business now, and we'll do some testing on this in a few minutes, you ask yourself this question, do I really enjoy what I'm doing? People say, well, I don't enjoy it, but I'm going to stay at it until I make a lot of money. I remember a woman came to me and she was having great trouble in the real estate industry. She said, Brian, I've done everything that you said. I've set goals. I've worked toward those goals. I manage my time well and, and so on. She said, but I'm still not achieving anything near what I want. She said, I haven't sold a house in three months. I said, well, what is your goal? She said, I want to win the million dollar award. I want to be the very top of the multiple listing service. I want to win that prize. I said, well, what would you do if you did win that million dollar award? She said, oh, I'd quit this lousy business and get into something I really liked. <laughs> I said, well, that's the problem. She said, well, I hate this. I hate real estate. I hate selling houses. I hate the hours. She said, but I'm determined to stay in it until I'm successful. And I explained to her that in every single case, if you don't love what you're doing, you're not going to be successful at it. The three keys are know what you're doing, become excellent in your chosen field, believe in what you're doing, and love what you're doing. Those three will guarantee you success more sure, faster in life than any other three keys that I've ever seen in all the literature. Okay, five key abilities of successful business people. Number one, judgment. And judgment comes simply from making mistakes and learning from them. They say that every single wise, intelligent, mature individual was once young and impetuous and foolish and did wicked, senseless, brainless, cruel, idiotic things. That's how they became wise and mature. It's scars and pain that make you wise and put the little crinkles in your corners. So the key thing is not avoiding making mistakes, because you're going to make mistakes, but to learn from every mistake. This is the hallmark of leaders. They never use the word failure. They'll use the word mistake. They'll use setback. They'll use glitch. And they find that the people who move ahead the fastest are the ones who make the most mistakes the earliest and learn the most lessons from them. Now, there's something about nature in the business world that is very unrelenting, in that if you make a mistake in business and you don't learn from it, nature will enable you to make that mistake again. And if you don't learn from it the second time, nature will keep putting you through that hurdle or over that hoop and throwing you flat on your face until you learn the lesson and you say, okay, I got it. I finally learned it. I'm not going to do that anymore. And then you have judgment. Then you have wisdom. Then you go on to the next hurdle. Remember, the hurdles never stop. The most successful multimillionaires and billionaires that you read about in the newspapers and the magazines have fights, struggles, battles, setbacks, obstacles, defeats, disappointments every single day. The difference between winners and losers is that winners pick themselves up, learn what they can, salvage the very best they can from it, and carry on. And losers think that these mistakes, these setbacks, these heartaches are happening to them for the first time in history. Watch for the trends. Many successful business people say that trend analysis is the most important single skill of the business person, which means foresight to think what's likely to happen in the future as a result of what is happening today. Leadership is the ability to inspire, to elicit extraordinary performance from ordinary people. Leadership is a key quality uh, of successful business people. And remember, you can only inspire others to the degree to which you are yourself inspired. In other words, you must be really excited about what you're doing if you expect to inspire others to be excited about helping you do what it is. And all great businesses have inspiring leaders at the head of the businesses. Communications ability is absolutely critical for successful business people, which means three things. The ability to interact effectively one-on-one, -on -one, the ability to make presentations, to stand up in front of groups or to make presentations to lenders or to make presentations to customers, and the ability to write effectively. Peter Drucker says the three key tools of the executive are the report, the presentation, and the meeting. And if you are poor at any one of those areas of communications, you owe it to yourself to become better. Finally, sales ability. The ability to influence, persuade, motivate people to act in a certain way. I am always astonished when people come to me and they say, I want to start a business, but uh, I need to get somebody who can sell the product for me. 
I tell them, if you don't have somebody who can sell the product for you, don't put a penny into the business. There's a thousand, there's a million products out there that are not moving because there's nobody to sell them. The ability to sell is one of the rarest qualities in all of business enterprise. And all the big successful companies in the world spend millions of dollars a year training their salespeople. So if you are not good at selling and you want to start a business or you want to build a business, you owe it to yourself to become good at it. You owe it to yourself to back off and take the time to practice because all sales ability is learned. Some people say, well, I just don't have the gift of gab or I'm not a good salesman. Nobody was a good typist when they started. Nobody could ride a bicycle when they started. Nobody could drive a car when they started. Nobody can run a computer when they started. Nobody could sell when they started either. They all learned. The key is this, is that if there are skills that are essential for success, your job is to learn those skills. Not to deny it, not to delay it, not to put it off, not to find excuses, but if you want to be successful, you have to do it. Okay, career advancement strategies. What we call the niche strategy is terribly important. It's based on an enormous amount of research I did at the university and that other people have done. And it is looking at your business environment and saying, what are the critical parts of your business environment? What are the areas that represent your areas of strength, but especially, what are your areas of weakness? In a business, you will find that it's like a chain. A business always collapses, always breaks at its weakest link. The business always collapses at its weakest point. And in looking at the purpose of a business, we know that the purpose of a business is to create a customer, is to serve a customer efficiently and economically. Cash flow is the lifeblood of an enterprise. So if you're working for a company, one of the things you have to decide is, if I want to move ahead rapidly in this company, I have to get myself into an area in the company that is vital to the survival of the company. Does that make sense? Because if you're in an area of the company that is irrelevant to the survival of the company, you can never become valuable and important and highly paid and responsible. So what we do is we know that any interruption to cash flow threatens the survival of the enterprise. So we look at where is the biggest interruption to cash flow likely to come from. Now usually, the most important function is marketing. The most important single function in an organization is marketing. If sales stop, the business collapses. 60 to 80 percent of all businesses that run into trouble run because sales slow down. If marketing is the key area in your company, you owe it to yourself to become great at marketing, to get into the marketing area, get into sales, get into strategic marketing, get into the part of the company that's important. The second part that may be important is finance. If the organization that you're with is dependent upon financial institutions. It has to borrow a lot of money. It has to raise capital in the stock market. If that's the key to its success and growth, then you owe it to yourself to get into that area because the company's growth will be determined by how successful they are. And if you can be fundamentally important in that area, you can really dramatically increase your value in a short period of time. The production area is very interesting. And I read a study actually done by the University of Alberta where they went into a brewery and they were looking at this idea of critical environments. And they found that in the brewery, the most important single function in the brewery was the production area. That the brewery's customers were pretty largely fixed. The delivery system, the distribution system was pretty much established. Its market share was established. It manufactured beer and sold it on a regular, systematic basis. The only thing that could cause the shutdown of the organization and the cutoff of cash flow was if the equipment broke down. Now, the equipment was maintained by the maintenance engineers. That meant that the head maintenance engineer was the most important single person in the company. He was more important than the president. And the person who was the head engineer was the highest paid next to the president. He had the greatest perks because if he didn't do his job properly, the whole company came to a halt. And this is often the case in organizations that depend on production. Distribution. Food distribution is very, very important. If it doesn't get to the stores on time, you know, if it gets to the stores a week late, Sometimes it's, it's too bad, you have to throw it away. Another example is fashion. The people in the fashion industry who are in control of the distribution, the outlets, the stores that sell the fashions, moving the fashions from production to the stores as quickly as possible, are the people who are key in the fashion industry. Why is that? Because fashions are timely. If you don't get it to the right stores, getting it there six months later in perfect condition is not quite good enough, is it? If it how about record distribution? How about distribution of books or anything else? Anything that can become dated, the distribution function is vital. The people who are essential in distribution become the most valuable people in the company. Research is important. Look at Silicon Valley. What is the most important single function in Silicon Valley that's making people millionaires? It's research, coming up with new products and processes. They know that the market will gobble up 
all the new products that they can come out with if the products will serve a market need. It is coming up with the products, so it's the engineers, the technicians, the research and development specialists that are getting paid one, two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year. And of course, regulatory environment, if you have to work with government, look at Washington DC jammed with lobbyists, jammed with representatives, senior representatives of major industries and industrial groups because they require protection, they require tax benefits, they require relaxation of environmental controls and so on. Those become absolutely vital elements within a business. And finally, labor and the people who are superb at dealing with labor are critical. Now, the only reason I point out these points, by the way, marketing, finance, production, distribution, research, regulatory, and labor, is that in every business, you will find, by checking one of these, that if you're having troubles in your business, the weakness is in one of these areas. If it's in your own business or any other company, that you can use this as a checklist and say, where are we falling down? Remember, the company always collapses on the side of the weakest pillar. All right, knowledge is power. Specialized knowledge or skills in a vital area enhance promotability. Control of vital information is power. The more I learn that makes me important to that company, the better off I am. And I learned a very good lesson very early is learn all you can, never tell all you know. If you tell all you know, then what happens is they don't need you anymore. Strive for excellence. Be the most knowledgeable person in your chosen area within the organization. Do it quietly, and pretty soon the rewards will start to flow to you. Okay, what are the reasons for business failure? In my estimation, there are 14 major reasons for business failure. Number one reason for business failure, lack of direction, the failure to establish specific goals and plans to achieve them. If you don't have specific goals, what you do is you become reactive. You are either acting on your environment or you are reacting. Most companies, in my estimation, 95% are in a reactive mode in that they are not acting at all. They are just simply reacting to what happens every single day because they don't have clear goals and plans to achieve them. Lack of a complete business plan is a major reason for failure. Do you know why that is? It's because the ability to put together a business plan is a major act of business competence. The reason people don't put them together is primarily because they don't know how. The reason that they fail is because they don't know how. When they develop the competence to put together a business plan, they also develop other competences that go with it. Impatience is a major cause of business failure. Trying to do too much too soon. Trying to cover too much. Greed is a major cause of business failure. A very good friend of mine, very successful consultant said, Brian, the secret to success in business is to get rich slowly. Don't try to get rich all at once. Get rich a little bit at a time. Do it slowly. If you're going to get rich, waiting an extra year isn't going to hurt you. More people lose their shirts because they get involved in what you might call a get-rich-quick scheme, something that's going to make them rich in a hurry. And they're not going to have to do a lot of work. So they plunge, and the plunge sets them back sometimes five and ten years uh, in terms of their savings. Number four, action without thinking, as Peter Drucker says, is the cause of every failure. Action without thinking, impetuousness, is the cause of every failure. And especially not listening to your intuition. Not listening to your gut feeling. One of the most important things that you have is intuition. If you listen to your gut feeling, it'll almost always give you the right answer, especially with regard to people. Do not ignore your intuition with regard to other people. Five, poor cost control, overspending, especially at the beginning. Almost invariably, when people start a business, they will buy things that they would never think of buying if they'd been in business for six months. Basic rule at the beginning of a business is save every single penny. The basic rule is simply this, conserve cash, conserve cash, conserve cash. Every day, get up in the morning and say, what can I do today to conserve cash? Biggest mistakes that I've ever made in business are plunging into two and three and five year leases right at the beginning of a business and then finding that the business won't sustain it. Poor quality of product. Nothing will sink a business faster. It's difficult to sell and it's difficult to get repeat business. Many people think, well, if it's, it may not be a very good product, but uh, I'll sell lots of it and then I'll make some money and then I'll do something else. The fact is that the more you advertise a poor product, the less it works. The more you advertise a good product, the better it works. So don't ever handle a poor quality product. Don't ever justify trying to sell a poor quality product because it's going to come back to haunt you. Insufficient working capital which means an expectation of immediate cash flow. The biggest mistake that people make is they think that they're going to have positive cash flow in 30 to 60 days. They talk to people and people reassure them. They think it's going to be all right. The key there to remember is that if you set a break-even point, you need six months capital in order to open up. If you don't have six months of capital, 
then open up on a smaller scale. And second of all, take whatever you consider to be your break-even point. Say you think you're going to break even in three months, multiply that times three. The law of three comes out in every single study of business, in every single product or process. Always take your most conservative, most reasonable break-even point and multiply it by three, because that's far more realistic. And make sure you have enough capital to last that long. Number eight is bad or non-existent budgeting. Failure to develop pro formas and budgets for operations. Many people actually start a business and embark upon what we call guaranteed losses. Because they haven't done budgeting and they haven't worked out how much it's going to cost and how much they're going to have to pay, they haven't worked out that they're making a loss on every single item that they're selling. You've heard the old saying of the fellow who says, I lose money on every item I sell, but I make it up on the volume. <laughs> Do you know how many business people actually operate on that? And because instead of sitting down and doing a pro forma, working out all their costs, all their expenses, and how much they're likely to have at the end in terms of profits, they find that in many cases they don't have any profits at all, and yet they're working their heart out. They can't understand. They're doing so much business, but they're going broke day by day. So just the fact that you draw up budgets and pro formas is a very, very good discipline, and we'll show you how to do that later. Inadequate financial records. Most accountants will tell you, the surest way to go broke is to treat your bookkeeping as though it were an irrelevant sideline. Throw all your receipts in a box and get to them at the end of the year. One of the things which I do recommend, by the way, is if you're not good at bookkeeping, don't do it. Hire somebody else. Number 10, major reason for business failure, loss of momentum in the sales department, which leads to a loss of cash flow and a collapse of the business venture. It's the number one reason for business failure is people get too busy doing other things and they think that sales will just keep on coming in. And lo and behold, sales are like water in a pump. You notice that? You keep pumping the pump and the water keeps flowing. What happens if you stop pumping the pump? The water stops flowing. With sales and marketing, you have to be pumping that pump all the time. The instant that the strong executives, the most important people take their hands off that pump, the sales and marketing effort just burns to a halt and the whole company falls apart. I've worked for two companies now that got so carried away with their success that they became administrative companies and they felt that sales would just come to them because they had established themselves in the marketplace. Now it was a matter of setting up administrative systems. Within nine months, one company that went from zero to three million dollars in business in four years, the men had worked all their lives for that opportunity. They built their company. They had made it in life. Nine months later, they were dead. A business consultant came in and told them, what you have to do now is really work on administration. Set up your internal systems, your internal controls. They got so carried away with it. Nine months later, the company was dead. All the top salespeople left, and the market just turned their back on them and walked away. Well, failure to anticipate market trends. Changes in demand, changes in customer preference, changes in the economic situation. When gasoline prices go up, what's that going to do? When interest rates go up, what's that going to do? When the real estate industry increases or decreases, what is it going to do to your business? Watching economic trends is very important. Number 12, lack of managerial ability or experience. People just simply don't have the experience or the ability to be in business. People don't know what they're doing. Uh, they don't understand about pro formers. They don't understand about budgets. They don't understand about selling or marketing or advertising. And lo and behold, most cases, they won't take any advice either. So you can always get experience or ability if you do it slowly. But if you try to do it all at once, what you do is instead of accelerating your career, you set yourself back five or 10 years. Indecisiveness is a major reason uh, for failure. The inability to make decisions in the face of difficulties. Things start to go wrong, and what do you do is you put off making hard decisions. Another thing is inability to make decisions, delaying decisions because of fear of hurting people's feelings. Keeping on incompetent people, staying in business relationships that aren't working for fear of hurting somebody's feelings is one of the major causes for failure in small and medium-sized businesses. Isn't that interesting? Interesting statistic came out of some very large consulting studies that were done a few years ago, is that if we cannot immediately cut off the deadwood and keep working with only people who can do the job, chances are they'll drag us under. And afterwards, you know what? They'll hate you for having kept them on for so long. Bad human relations with staff, suppliers, creditors. 95% of all business failures come from an inability to get along with other people. Number 14, which underlies everything, is diffusion of effort, lack of priorities, going off on tangents, and the inability to concentrate on doing the right things and doing things one at a time. Now, what are the reasons for business success? Well, there's 10 reasons for business success, many of which are the converse of the reasons for business failure. Number one is the product or service is well-suited to the needs and requirements of the current market. 
Very important. Number two is there is a complete business plan developed before commencing business operations. The development of a business plan, although it is laborious, is a sign of managerial competence. It tells you and it tells the world that you're qualified to start a business. The inability or unwillingness to develop a plan tells the world that you are not competent. Number three, a complete market analysis is followed by a development of an advertising, promotion, and sales program. In other words, you sit down and you determine who is your competitor, who is your market, where do you sell, who buys, why they buy, what benefits they buy, what you do better, where you're going to sell to, and so on, which we'll talk about in a subsequent session. Uh, and then you design your sales programs and work it out. Let me give you an example. I went and sat down with a person who was going to open a store in a shopping center. And we went through the financial analysis. I was trying to lease them the space, as a matter of fact. I went through the financial analysis, and it turned out that that person would have to have something like 38 customers a day spending an average of $25 per person in order to survive selling the products that they were selling. And their average sale was $12 per person, and it was a small rural shopping center, and they would never be able to survive. I just worked them through it. Based on what you have to sell in order to survive, you're not going to be able to do it in this location. And he said, no, no, no. He said, you don't understand. And he opened the store anyway, and he lost five years of savings. He went broke six months later. So the financial analysis and the marketing analysis is important. Tight financial controls, good budgeting, accurate bookkeeping, and accounting. The basic rule to remember in running a business, and I've worked with some of the most successful business people in the world, is frugality, frugality, frugality. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Pinch every penny until it screams. Be very, very careful. As we said before, conserve cash. Go cheap every single penny that you possibly can. Buy used equipment, used furniture, used carpeting, rent, used space, and so on. Be very, very careful about expenses. A high degree of competence, capability, and integrity on the part of the key staff. Very important. Hire only the people you need and hire people who can do what you need them to do. Don't try to train people on the job, especially in a small and medium-sized business. Good internal efficiency, good time management, clear job descriptions, clear and measurable output responsibilities. In other words, everybody knows what they're supposed to do, knows the most important things they're supposed to get done, and manages their time well in order to do it. Number seven is determination, persistence, and patience on the part of the business owners, the business principals. Number eight is good communications amongst the staff, an open-door policy. The better the communications, the more everybody knows within an organization, the better that organization functions. We find that in every single case where you have a problem organization, you have secrecy, you have poor communications amongst the staff, poor communications up and down. People are playing it cool. In your big companies like IBM and Hewlett Packard, everybody's on a first name basis. Everybody can have any information they need in order to do their job well. Number nine, strong momentum in the sales department and an emphasis on marketing. Everybody thinks marketing all the time, which leads us to number 10, a concern for the customer at all times is a top priority. Every single successful company that I've ever seen has one characteristic amongst all the people in that company. It's love for the customer. Love for the customer. They love their customers. They are very concerned. If a customer has a problem or a complaint or a difficulty, they're very, very concerned about it. And you'll find that right from the switchboard all the way through, when you call a good company, they treat you like you're really, really important. I used to work for a large department store chain that subsequently had a lot of financial problems. The clerks would be so busy doing their busy work behind the counters that when a customer actually came along, they'd be irritated. They look up as though you were actually interrupting them. They had lost all sight of the fact that all of the arrangement of the counters and the merchandise and everything else was for the, when the customer came in. And what happens is they treat customers indifferently. They say, oh, geez, well, I can't do that. Now I'm going on coffee. Or could you hurry up? It's almost my lunch break. I was doing some consulting with a firm just last week where the manager was appalled. Somebody came in to buy $800 worth of merchandise at a quarter to five that had to be installed. And it took about 20 minutes to install it. And the person says, I'm sorry, we can't take the business. You'll have to come back tomorrow because we shut down at five o'clock. And it takes 20 minutes to install it. They turned an $800 customer away. He said, we never know, never knew whether that customer ever came back or not. But uh, it was certainly disconcerting to find that there are people doing that. We spend a fortune advertising to get them to come in. And they come in and they want to buy. And we tell them to go away because it's just not convenient right now. Do you know what the person had to do? They had to go drinking at 5 o'clock with their buddies. And they didn't want to be late. 
So be very careful about that. Those are the reasons for business success. Now what we're going to do is a very brief exercise. I'm going to ask you to answer some questions. And these questions are very important. They're important for now. They're important for tomorrow. They're important for the future. And they enable you to focus on the very most important things that you could or should be doing within your business. And I'm going to give you one minute to answer each of these questions. And I want you to write them as fast as you can. Write the first things that come to your mind. Don't think about it. The first number one question is list five jobs or full-time activities, paid or unpaid, that you have done in your life. List the first five that come to mind. List five jobs or full-time activities. Anything that you've done, whether it's been uh, paid, charitable, whether it's been in school, whether it's been uh, with a social organization politically, write the first five full-time activities that you have engaged in since you left high school. However many you have, now go quickly to question number two and write down the one thing that you enjoyed most about each job or full-time activity. In the order that you wrote the jobs, write down what you enjoyed the most. What part of the work did you enjoy? What part gave you the greatest amount of satisfaction in that work? When you look back on it, what makes your heart glow, if you like, or makes you happy when you remember that particular activity? All right, go to question number three. Again, thinking back over the jobs, what did you do best in each job or activity? What were you best at? What part of the job or activity did you do the best? Were you the most capable at? If you were doing five or 10 different things, what part of it did you excel at? What part of it were you the very best at? Your performance, your skills, your capability were the very finest in that particular area of the job. Now, go to question number four. What was your major accomplishment in each of those jobs or full-time activities? What one thing did you accomplish? Was it a technical thing? Was it an interpersonal thing? What thing did you achieve that you remember the most as being the highlight of that job uh, or activity? Just think through. If, in, in retrospect, the one thing that you did or the one thing that you accomplished or achieved successfully in that job, even if it was just learning a lesson, uh, learning something important, something of value that you got, additional training, whatever it happens to be, write it out as quickly as you can. All right, go on to the next question. Wherever you are, go on to the next question. Now list five activities, experiences, events, or situations in your life that have given you immense personal satisfaction, a feeling of importance, of self-liking, and self-worth. It could have been getting married, it could have been getting a degree or graduating, it could have been anything. But write the first five that come to mind as quickly as possible. All right, question number six. If you could have any job or be in any business, what do you think you would enjoy the most? Imagine a billionaire who controlled a variety of organizations came up to you and said, you could have any job you wanted or be in any business in the world. Which one would you choose? What job would you want? Would you want to work for someone else or would you want to work for yourself? If you wanted to work for yourself, what business would you want to be in? What sort of position would you like to have in that business? Write the very first thing that comes to mind. All right, question number seven. How much do you want to be earning in one year, in three years, in five years? in 10 years. Very, very important that you have an idea of what these figures are. And don't be too concerned about how correct or how accurate you are. Just write down what you consider to be a reasonable goal to achieve in the next one, three, five, ten 10 years. The wonderful thing about that is that 95% of people walking around will never write down a financial goal in their whole life. And they cannot understand why they do not improve their financial conditions. The very taking of that exercise that you just did moves you into the top 5% in the world in terms of future planning. And you will be astonished. I've had people take that exercise and never look at it again until two years later. And then open it up and look at it and say, by doggone it, they have achieved those financial goals. Just writing it down, programmed it into the brain. And over the previous two years, the opportunities to achieve the financial goals came to them. All right, question number eight, and the final question in this session. Imagine that we had a bottle of pills that guaranteed you against failure. And the question is this, what one great thing would you dare to attempt if you knew you could not fail? Each of you would get one of these pills. You could take this pill. You'd be guaranteed of success, 100% of any one thing that you attempted in your world, especially in your business and your career.